Wisconsin Harbor Distillery project. It just is unbelievable. We'll take some video and some pictures when we get back so right. we can kind of show the audience what it looks like. You've, you've, you've reinvented yourself as an entrepreneur a number of times. I mean, if anything, you're just, you're, it's the evolution of Rhonda, and, you know, in terms of the evolution of beer and what you're doing with Boston Harbor. Well, when you get to be this old, you get plenty of time to do oh, things. Oh, whatever. <laughs> it's just, fine, it's just, it is what it is. I just think it's so uh, awesome to hear about this, like, I never, I never quit attitude. I, I was curious, kind of two things. One is, I mean, you also had cancer, scared, or you did have cancer. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah. So That was scary. Yeah, so like, cancer survivor, mother of three, serial entrepreneur, was there any moment where you were just like, why the F am I doing this? And then you're just like, I'm gonna throw the towel and I'm done. You know, that's- And then a, why didn't you? Well, my, my oldest was like 11 at the time. And I, when I had New Century Brewing Company and it was February and I, I just, you know, it was freezing cold here. You're trying to sell light beer. And, and I just, I came home and I was on the couch and like, oh, I don't know whether I should keep doing this, whether I should, shut this thing down and here's my 11 year old daughter who's 22 now and she looked at me and she said my mom is not a quitter oh. I was like yeah you're right you're right and you know she inspired me at that moment um, shortly thereafter I was diagnosed with with breast cancer and it was pretty aggressive and it was scary because I had these three kids um, I ended up having a left side mastectomy which is great, we caught it. Um, but when I had to tell my children, that was the hardest part. Like, you, there's nothing, there's no book or parental guidance that you get. So I was putting her in a bed one night. It's like, she was, I think she was 12. And I told her. And she said, Mom, can you, can you die from cancer? And I said, I didn't know what to say, but I yeah. said, okay, I'll tell her the truth. Callie, yeah, you can, but that's not me. You can die from walking across the street. Um, you know, you can die from walking across the street, not looking both ways, but that's not gonna happen to me. I'm gonna be fine. And so when you face with that stuff, Always, I think honesty is the best policy. And if you can bring it back to something that is relatable, it seemed to work out just yeah. fine. Yeah, so it, you know, my daughter, my lucky, luckily I'm in Boston, Dana Farber's here, and I have the best set of doctors. And he told me, he said, You're going to be all right. You're going to be fine. And I believe him. Yeah. You know, the hardest part is when you lose your hair. Right. And that, you just, all of a sudden, every day you're changing your hair. And it's, and it's, real. it's more than seeing, vanity. You're seeing it. Yeah, and everybody else does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? It's not just vanity. But that was the worst of it. And you get through it any way you can. I drank a lot, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's all good. It's, I'm just actually um, 11 years and um, it's 11 years ago. I mean, it's with you. Thank you. That's you. Yeah. It's all good. And, uh, you know, if it had to happen to somebody better me than most because I'm strong and I knew I could fight it and I could beat it and I have the right attitude. And so as soon as I was diagnosed and my husband and I went to see the doctor and they told me that I needed a mastectomy and my business wasn't doing that well. And I said, you know, maybe it's time to shut it down. This is a good reason if you need one. Right. And he said, you know what, whatever you want. Like he was like, whatever you want. Yeah. yeah. And we were not in the car 10 minutes when I said, well, what the hell am I gonna do? Sit around and watch the grass grow and be sick? Yeah. So I said, I, I'm gonna keep it going. And I did. That's awesome. I love the fact, though, that you were just sitting on your couch and just like, why the heck am I doing this? I'm throwing the towel on your daughter at 11. It's like, my mom's not a quitter. Right. So, you know, we were talking earlier about you've got all these kids, how do you do it? And it just, they, they realize that, 
you know, I'm separate from them, even though we'll always be together and yeah. there's always that love. And I just think that's so important, though, for kids and parents to be their own people. As much as you're a family unit, you're still your own people. Yeah. Um, you're not your kids. You're not your spouse. You're your own self. And they're not you. And they're not you. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I, you know, in, in a lot of the stuff that I'm learning about right now, and that's like the number one reason people get angry with their children is because they're showing up a way, they're showing up in the world in a way that is like the parent and they don't like it because they're seeing it in their kid or they're showing up in the world in a way that they don't want other people to show up and they get angry about it but it's at the end of the day the kids their own self you know yeah to thine own self be true yeah and that is how we've raised our that's shakespeare but i borrow that no it's okay and that's you're, how you're we good. raise our children yeah. and that's how we live our lives my husband's an entrepreneur too <laughs> so you can imagine what too. the kitchen looks like <laughs> that's great um and this is what the kids grow up with and I'll be honest with you, two out of the three of them are like, I'm never being an entrepreneur. Yeah. <laughs> no way. I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen the real deal. Yeah. But to each his own. Yeah, that's cool. When we were just stopping there, you were talking about Putnam. 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 As the brand that you're bringing out right now and the meaning behind it. So can you give us just a quick little... Yeah, no, Putnam was the guy that, um, he actually built the port that we're on. It was very important to the history of America. He automated the manufacture of the hut forged horseshoe nail and had government contracts that supplied both sides of the Civil War. So that was the inspiration for the name Putnam and the horse and rider and the horseshoe, which are sort of icons that are inextricably linked to whiskey. Yeah. That's how I ended up with horses in Boston on the same <laughs> label. Um, but that was my inspiration. And and the, the area, that the building that we're in, has been the center of entrepreneurial commerce since the mid-1800s. So as an entrepreneur, of course, that was an inspiration as well. Um, and then it was the George, so when a car came in and he went out of business, because you didn't need horseshoe nails anymore, in came the, the George Lawley shipyard. Lawley's is a famous uh, boat builder. He actually built America's Cup winning yachts. And in my particular building, he too had government contracts and made minesweepers for World War II. So I have He's my bad. small batch rum, 100% molasses, which is New England style, named for lollies. And then the last notable entrepreneur to have commerce there was the Seymour's Ice Cream Factory. And uh, I actually have a, a Kahlua and Bailey's disruptors, I call them, craft disruptors. Uh, I make a coffee liqueur with all New England ingredients, all natural, delicious, and a maple rum cream. Yeah, it's horrible. Oh and, my God. Uh, <laughs> Coming from Canada, too, it's just like, mm, mm. <laughs> only a sip, though, right? Because we're driving. Right, really. yes. Yeah. A little bit of coffee. Um, so they, they were called Seymour's, but then I got a little trademark kerfuffle with a winery that basically had the name Seymour's. And uh, they did a little research on me and my company and decided they lawyered up and wanted me to send him a check every quarter for the name Seymour, so right. I changed that name. And then, of course, the spirit of Boston, which is really a tribute to my legacy and starting out in the beer industry with uh, Boston Beer Company. And we, we take finished beer and we distill it into this delicious spirit. Government won't let me call it whiskey, and they won't let me call it distilled beer. So, spirit is that catch-all term, and we call it the spirit of Boston. Yeah, and it's also just delightful. Thank it's, you. Yeah, I, can, I couldn't believe it. it uh, Each I mean, one I'm, is so different. I'm not you, so I mean, it tastes like a wonderful whiskey. Yeah. And so, if the government says you can or can't say it, I'll say it. <laughs> it tastes like a wonderful whiskey, and I love whiskey. So yeah. I mean, like, it is it is the future. I, I actually, like I said, I have a trademark on the evolution of beer because that's what it is. And that's what's so exciting for me is because whiskey starts off as the same process as beer. It's just the next evolution. It's yeah, like physically, like literally. Literally. Yeah. Yeah, it's just one different piece of equipment and it changes everything. And yeah. So I think you're going to see a lot more of the, the, the blurring of the lines between beer and whiskey. Awesome. Yeah, I'm excited. It's for that excited for I, it's a great time to be a you know whiskey drinker in America. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> if there was something you knew now that you could go 
back and tell an earlier version of yourself, what would it be? Um, well, first thing that comes to mind is cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. I mean, any business, it's really the lifeblood of the business. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, it's, so always be mindful of that. I mean, I've started businesses, unfortunately been undercapitalized. And I've started them undercapitalized because I couldn't raise the capital. It wasn't for lack of trying, right. whether it was not available or just not available to me or nobody believed in what I was trying to do enough. But fortunately, there's always those investors that I have um, that have believed in me. But you, So that's part of it. Um, try to make less emotional decisions and more factual decisions as much as possible. That's really important. It's business after all. I mean, you know, your heart has to be part of it, but it does come back to it's business and you need to create value for your shareholders and for yourself um, and for your family. Yeah. So then, could you give us an example of a, an emotional decision and how it shows up? Like, what made you say that? Yeah, well, it's daily decisions. You know, it's like, this is really what I, I, I want to do, but this is what I should do. Ah, that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, can you just talk about that a little bit more? Because I think that is wonderful. And everybody needs to hear more about this, including me. This is what I want to do, and this is what I should do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, as a, a, entrepreneurs, we love to create things. We, we love to create things that perhaps consumers don't even know they need. Right. And... You know, it goes back to the innovation story. It's like leading with innovation. I learned the hard way that you can't really lead with innovation, even though that's the prideful piece, is that, hey, look, this is something that doesn't exist yet. Or right. No one's done yet. And we're it's a completely so, new way of doing this that no one's even thought about. And that's, that's excitement. Yeah. That's creating something interesting of value. But they're d discipline. Let me give you another example. Like canned cocktails. Given that my background is in the beer business, a lot of beer sold in cans, the cold box is a different battleground than the whiskey shelves, for sure. example. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I'm like holding myself back from doing canned cocktails because there's a ton of energy towards canned wine, canned cocktails. Sure, yeah, big time. And I am literally not embarking on that as a company at this time because I just don't have, I don't have the resources, you know, I don't have the, the go to the go to market structure to get it done. Mm -hmm. And I think that's okay. I don't have to be the first one in. No. If I decide to do it later, I just have to have a point of difference, whether it's better quality or better packaging or better pricing or better plate, whatever it is. It's not going anywhere. I don't have to rush into that market. Right, it's not going to disappear. New shiny penny everywhere, right. for example. So it, it takes some discipline to do that. Of course, I have all these different brand names under the umbrella of Boston Harbor. Yeah, well, that's okay. So, um, but now, you know, it's time to kind of figure out how they all fit and work with what I have. That's cool. After I launch Demon Seed. It's, um, okay, well... We gotta to touch on that one quickly, just so that people know what it is. But um, Warren Buffett said that he got, he built his wealth on the investments he said no to. Steve Jobs said he was more proud of the things that they said no to as a company than what they said yes to. Huh. Um, so I think what you just said there has got a lot of validity to it. And just because it's in front of us doesn't mean we have to go get it. A lot of times things aren't going to disappear, and even if they are disappearing, then we probably don't want to be there in the first place. True. So that's it was like that was a true point. Well, well, being a, a small undercapitalized company, again, you know, you have to be careful because you, innovation is is expensive. expensive. <laughs> yes, true. Enough. It's expensive, yeah. and you know, for me, it's great because I have my little skunk works, and it, as long as I can get something to the consumer that they want, that cuts through, that. Um, is meaningful that they're willing to pay for that's great meanwhile I'm, I'm strengthening my my innovations if you will. like this demon seed I just talked about yeah, it's a so scorpion pepper flavored whiskey 
with um, real maple syrup and fresh ginger. What? It's spicy, hot, exciting, and guess what? My master dis master distiller brought it to me. He brought the whole thing, the name, to me before we even opened the doors at the distillery. So four years ago, and I went, "What the heck is this?" Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> And I said, what, you, what? Oh, my gosh, that's so, that's so hot. That's so spicy. He's like, just wait. Because the maple syrup comes up after. Right. That's so good. Well, you're going to have some soon. Awesome. I got it. And eat. I said, what do you call this stuff? And he said, demon seed. I said, if you think that we're going to get demon seed in this distillery, it's not happening. Right. But it was so good and so breakthrough. I've Obviously, I've never forgotten it. Right. And it's been on the back burner. And... I've kind of figured out how how it fits, yeah. and we're about to launch it. Awesome! Yeah, so exciting. Well, um, and I think, but even that, even that idea of innovation with Demon Seed, four years, you know, back burner, five almost, right? Yeah, yeah. So like, innovation doesn't have to get to market quick, right? For it to be valuable, absolutely. Which is super cool. And, I'm essentially just saying this to remind myself <laughs> that I don't necessarily See, have to go do right. it all. I and mean, so then, um, in terms of where someone can taste this stuff, is it visit Boston, come to the distillery right now? Or where can I go find a spot to taste this? Where can we get this stuff? Well, I have about a thousand points of distribution in New England. Sounds like a lot, but half bars and restaurants and half package stores yeah, okay. or grocery stores you know in Massachusetts it's this weird law that you can only have three licenses and they just moved it up to five and then in two years it's going to go to seven or something so yeah so it's like <laughs> a needle in a haystack there's like three whole foods that have a an alcoholic beverage license right, right, so, right, right. you know and I think one of them has only beer and wine and, you know so You've got a little bit of that, but there's usually a package store on every corner. We're certainly not in every corner, but right. it's available for the asking. We legally can only ship to Massachusetts, so I couldn't ship to anybody else, right, right, which right. is kind of stupid because that's where I have most of my distribution and availability. Um, but you could go on our website. There's uh, some stores in Rhode Island that legally can ship to certain states. Oh, cool. <laughs> So you're hacking the distribution chain. Yeah, we're getting there. And online's coming around. And your wine is really leading the charge. But the like the beer beer franchise laws are very, very strong. And therefore, the distributors don't want online shipping. Right. Not to mention, yeah. um, it's like 35 pounds for every case. It's heavy to ship beer. Yeah. But a bottle of whiskey is like a bottle of wine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. Honestly, that's um, why I think that I'm just waiting for you to announce that it's available and that we can start buying it online. Yeah, well, this Harbor Masters Club that we're coming up with, which is, um, uh, it will be a, uh, it's like a subscription program. And it's going to be available to anybody in Massachusetts. Anybody in Massachusetts, yeah, and we'll probably find a partner that will be able to ship outside of Massachusetts. So, so. tell us a quickly, just give us a breakdown then of the, of the program. Uh, well, it's really, um, it has multifaceted, it's direct to the consumer stuff so that we can get our loyalists um, product that they want, um, any new releases, limited edition, um, it also has, when you come to the distillery, there'll be a loyalty component. The more you come, the more you get, the more people you bring, the more fun you have. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, that's that's the premise of it. You can also go all the way up to the Admiral level, which is you can come in, pick through our hundreds of barrels, pick the one you want, and when it's ready, we will actually bottle it up for you. You get your own private barrel. That's amazing. It will be. So what's the price of a barrel? Well, it depends. So which yeah, it depends on It depends back. which barrel, which proof, how old, mm -hmm. what you want in there. So it's that's where it gets complicated. Yeah, no, that's yeah. cool. <laughs> now, and what's the program called again? It's the Harbor Masters Club from Boston Harbor Distillery. Awesome. Yeah. All so right. it's all good. Yeah, we're getting there. This helps. 
Yeah, well, I mean, look, we'll see. I mean, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot of people that want to hear this story. Yeah, well, uh, and it's, it's just amazing. And thank you for taking us for a tour on the waterfront. Oh, yes. And for been... agreeing to do an I'm in a car with me. I, it's awesome. Yeah, it was I an love the pleasure. concept. Cool. Thank, thank you. you very much. Okay, see <laughs> you guys. Bye.